Okay, you're, uh, you've got a, the graphic novel. I, I should uh, plug this novel, by the way. The uh, graphic novel, He's Not Going to Take It, is due out on the 29th of February. Purchasing link will be just below this video. I suggest you check it out. Um, if I may ask you a question about that book, actually, it seems to stress the importance of free speech. Why this topic, and what do you think the biggest threat to free speech is at the moment? Well, first of all, you have not addressed the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to if you're not going to. Okay. And that is um, the color of the room that I'm in is not very metal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in the Caribbean, and this is the only room in the house, the guest room, that gets like a really good internet signal. <laughs> so I'm sorry. My dungeon, unfortunately, has no reception. So we're stuck with this background. Okay. It looks, it looks great. All right, let me make sure I got you still. I seem to have muted you. Uh, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? No, I muted you. How did I mute you? Come Can on. you hear me? Oh, I hear you now. Good. Okay. okay. Go so, so, um, so back to the book. You know, um, censorship is a subject that won't go away. Yeah. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, been an ongoing issue since I don't know yeah. since probably since the beginning of art and creativity itself. Yeah, yeah. You go back to puritanical times mm -hmm. and, you know, there's always been people putting leaves over the penises of statues and things like that. And I sometimes feel sorry for the for the the ultra conservative because it always seems that they try to stop, you know, they try to, to stop this progression towards what they call evil and they and wind up wind up settling and giving an inch. And every time the creative community gets an inch, we we want another inch, and we keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And if you look, you know where we come from, you know uh, from the from the, the the days of Michelangelo with with fig leaves over uh, genitalia yeah. to art today, and how you know and, and on internet and social media, and how I mean I mean the lid is off, really. The lid is off as far as what's accepted and what's not accepted. This said, uh, the really interesting thing about this uh, censorship now is the way the pendulum has swung mm -hmm. and how it's gone from a very right-wing evangelical Reagan era when I was there, conservative, uh, you know, censorship. It's now swung to a very left-wing, uh, super woke, uh, sensitive uh, let's not hurt anybody's feelings. That censorship too. Yeah. That censorship too. You can't say that because it, it hurts people's feelings. Can't say that because it's 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 it, it's 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 in, basically it's all about hurting feelings. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's it's not it's insensitive. You mm -hmm. can't say that. You can't say that. You know, I saw a um, a comedian named Mark Marin, okay. great podcast host, great comedian. He said, "No matter what you know, with it, me and my friends are going to use it against each other." So whatever word you change to, oh, he's not retarded, he's mentally challenged. He's not mentally challenged, he's on the spectrum. Well, guess what? You know what I say to my friends? What, are you on the spectrum? So, I mean, <laughs> just, you know, so you just keep changing the words and we're going to keep using those words. But um, again, just so the sh that's a long answer. So basically because this issue is so in the zeitgeist right now, censorship, I think, and so many people are interviewing me about it and, and uh it's been, you know, so many, I do so many interviews and documentaries, there's talk in Hollywood of a, uh, of actually doing a, uh, you know, a documentary, uh, a biopic yeah. on, the, on me in the Senate hearings, you know, so it's very much, people are reflecting on it. And, you know, uh, what's it, the more things change, the more they stay the same, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about um, um, the zeitgeist at the moment, your book, Frats. Um, it says it deals with toxic masculinity. Why do you feel you need to deal with that? And also, uh, out of interest, um, what do you think of the influence of the figure Andrew Tate, who is considered to be the epitome of toxic masculinity? Well, I don't know who Andrew Tate, so I'll have to uh, I'll have to Google him and look him up. Okay. Um, so, but as far as the toxic masculinity topic. I had no idea my book was about toxic masculinity. I wrote a I wrote about a uh, experience when I was growing up in the seventies, uh, gang environment. Uh, they were called fraternities, but they were just gangs with Greek letters. And um, 
And when I submitted it to publishers, everybody's going, oh my God, what a brilliant book. It's about toxic masculinity. <laughs> and I'm looking around going, it is? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, that. Oh yeah, sure. toxic masculinity. I said, That's <laughs> a, whatever gets my damn book published. And, you know, of course, stepping back, I go, oh yeah, I see what they're seeing in it. And it's certainly, you know, if you're looking at how effed up the uh, 60 year olds are today uh, and, and and older, oh, it gives you kind of insight that, well, this is how they grew up, you know, uh, you know, just uh, getting their asses kicked by these, by these fraternities or doing the ass kicking, you know, depending, you, you, you were one or the other. So yeah, I didn't know it was about, I really didn't write it to be right. I was just writing about a moment. Okay, okay. I mean, if we can uh, cast your mind way back to the Twisted Sister days, is it true that Pay the Price was the first song you wrote for Twisted Sister, and what inspired it? Uh, the song, yeah, now that, it's often confused with a song on Stay Hungry called The Price. Uh -huh. uh, Pay the Price uh, was the first song I wrote for Twisted Sister after they told me to shut up. Uh, <laughs> I was complaining about the about the originals they had, and I know oh, they suck, they suck, they suck. Do you write? Yes, I do. Uh -huh. What have you written? Nothing. <laughs> well, <laughs> shut up until you write something. I'm like, Burr. we had a band house. I went upstairs and I wrote Pay the Price, which was really uh, just, it was kind of, I was very um, into bad company at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, it was very, I was, I think I was listening to the album Burning Sky a lot. Uh -huh. And uh, so it was, it, it influenced me. And that song was pretty much a, uh, you know, just a sort of about a guy and a girl and, hey, you know, you're going to you're going to fall in love with me. And this is and I was just dealing, I was just uh, developing a relationship with my wife mm -hmm. at the 47 years ago. So there's a little bit of that in there. But the price itself, uh, which is a song people like say confuse it with or say hungry was now you're cutting to many years later and I'm living my dreams. But, you know, it's the old be careful what you wish for because you might get it. <laughs> and now I am away from home and I, you know, and I'm. And, and and I'm and I'm alone and I'm reflecting on the choices I made and you often you wonder like wow I didn't realize it seemed so cool being on stage and making records I didn't realize there was actual sacrifice involved in this process so I was I was dealing with sacri the sacrifice of of choosing a rock and roll lifestyle at that point uh, okay okay. Um, how influential were, um, I mean, in the early 70s, I mean, for me, uh, largely defined by a lot of those glam bands like Slade, T-Rex, Roxy Music. I mean, how... how oh, big brother, come on. It's, you're talking my language, man. Come on. Were they wow. a big influence on Twisted Sister? Me? I mean, yes, Twisted Sister for sure. Um, <laughs> Twisted Sister formed in 73. I joined in 76. They had already gone through a few band members, which is, you know, standard fare for any fledgling band trying to shake it out and find out who's who's gonna who's going to distance and who isn't mm -hmm. um and uh so those guys were uh were trying to be a new york dolls okay. those, i say those guys jj french uh is the uh, one of the original members in the band i think he's the only actually guy from that 73 incarnation right. and um so they wanted to be a new york dolls band and, uh, you know, they one of their big before they didn't have a record deal or anything. And they got a chance to open for Mott the Hoople. And that that was like a huge deal for them to, to you know, play with Mott the Hoople. So meanwhile, I am, you know, out in that same uh, club scene with an, a band called Peacock. P okay. is a P, C is in cock. Yeah. Those of you on the right can see the P. Those of you on the right can see the cock. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and I am listening to the same band it's it's bowie it's slade i mean slade 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 yeah, that is like one of the as far as creating anthems uh those guys could do a ted talk on that yeah. jim and uh, jim and naughty boy i would uh, you know those guys just knew how to write a hook and just ram it into your ear hole you know um and uh t-rex of course and yeah. and you know and all the bands coming out of england and that really the only well i was a new york dolls fan i was an alice cooper fan Oh, of course. Um, so those were sort of, you know, you, you had the, the predominance of glam bands of, of note were coming out of the UK. Yeah. Uh, Alice Cooper and, and uh, the Dolls were the only two really in those early 70s that were really making international noise. And the Dolls, you know, they weren't selling anything. You yeah. know, they were, they, they, you know, you know, Alice Cooper is really the only one. Yeah. What about the more arty stuff like Bowie and Roxy Music? Were they, would you cite them as an influence? 
Bowie for sure, but mm. you know, in particular era, his sort of his heart, the hard rock era, okay. you know, Diamond Dog, Ziggy Stardust, yeah, yeah. you know, Aladdin Sane, um, you know, in, in those eras. And then, you know, some flashes of metallic brilliance, like Width of a Circle earlier on, you know, where you're going, well, this guy, can he do more like that? You know, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, so, you know, it's definitely there. Roxy, not so much, although I was very intrigued by Roxy music. I certainly paid attention to them. Um, it was, you know, you know, Brian Ferry's, uh, you know, I don't know what you would call him, tuxedo, <laughs> tuxedo wearing, you yeah. know, low voice, you know, uh, you know, boys will be always, will be always, you know, uh, yeah. I did and then, in, uh, you know, I was, I was more from the Robert Plant school of singing upper register. And then when I burned my voice out, I found that, oh, I have a career as a uh, a tenor, Alice Cooper, uh, which Alice, Alice and I have talked about. He says, you're kind of like the upper register me. And I said, yeah. and that is by design, my friend. That's by design. So, yeah, I, I like those guys. I always felt um, very bad uh, for Ferry in that Bowie. And I, and I actually spent some time with some people in that Ferry camp. Um, and I know that this is something that he was devastated by he and Bowie were, were good friends. And then all of a sudden Bowie just takes his whole shtick. Yeah. The clothes, the haircut, the vocal range, the young Americans. We all got, that was very, that was Brian Ferry. And, and I was told that he felt devastated right. that, you know, because, but, but those in the, you know, those who paid close attention to Bowie's career know he is uh, a chameleon. Absolutely. And he has always been a chameleon. There's a great documentary on the triumvirate of Bowie, Lou Reed, and Iggy Pop. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you see it, have you seen it? I haven't. Oh, it's, no. it's worth watching. Um, Angie Bowie is just like no holes barred. <laughs> and I mean, they just connect the dots. I mean, and Bowie was producing Lou and he was producing Iggy. And, and you know, and they were, and he was... Gleam, he just just taking bits and pieces of these other guys. That was his specialty to take other people's shtick and then make it his own. Yeah. Bowie would always figure out how to make it his own, but at the same time, the uh, Brian Ferry thing was just unconscionable. Actually, I just, I mean, it was. I don't know. I mean, I felt like I was. Am I the only one who notices this? But they must in England, the UK. They must have said, "Damn, he's doing Ferry's whole act." It was <laughs> Brian Ferry's entire act. Yeah, yeah. Which which version of China Girl is is better, Bowie's version or Iggy Pop's version? Wow, um, <laughs> you know, I'm a I'm an Iggy fan. There's always a rawness to Iggy. It's like saying it was a better version of of all young dudes, uh, Mott or David. You yeah. know, and uh, and and I say Mott. There, there there's something about uh, you know uh, uh, Ian Hunter's. Uh, he's one of the few singers that actually embrace the English accent in his vocal performances. Yeah. Him and Johnny Rotten, famously, just about every English singer imitates Americans. Yeah. They sound, the pronunciations are all Americanized. So but the track, Ian, the, you know, he laughed all night about it. I mean, just doing his English thing. It was such a much more raw and connected to the, to the lyrics. So I kind of, uh, I like Bowie's. I like. I should say um, Iggy's rawness, and I, and and you know, and of course, Martha Hoople's rawness as well. Okay, um, the band The Dictators uh, was signed to a major label. I think they were doing quite well. How did you manage to persuade Mark Denham and Mendoza to join Twisted Sister? So the Dictators were signed to Electra. They were out on the road with Blue Oyster Cult, with Kiss. Yeah, yeah. They were doing arena tours, and when Mark. Um, was uh, off the road, he would come down to the local bars and clubs to see Twisted Sister. Yeah. And um, and I remember the first time we saw him, I saw him there. I didn't know who he was, but we both, you know, had our hair out to here. And it was this sort of like begrudging, like nod, like, yeah, yeah, good hair, good hair. Uh -huh. And uh, but eventually we started talking. We found out that he was with the Dictators and um, other bands used to come down. A lot of bands used to come. I mean, you find out after the fact that uh, Steve Vai was hanging out at the clubs and Satriani was coming down to see us. And so many, we were this phenomenon in the Northeast and so many Bon Jovi and all these guys just used to come. It was like, 
you went to see sister. They call sister. You went to see sister. Um, you know, when they were playing and and uh, the Stray Cats used to be coming down. Back then, Setzer had pigtails. It was a band before they were called the Stray Cats. And they used to come down. Um, but uh, so eventually we started talking to him. I found out he was the Dictators. And you know, it was great. You know, now he now he was even more like, he was, you know, he was in a band that was touring. And um, then we had, um, he left the Dictators. And we had a, a spot for a roadie. And he literally said, hey, man, um, you need a crew guy? And I was like, you're a touring band. <laughs> he goes, yeah, but I'm not in the band right now. And if I can't be in a band, I'll work for a band. I mean, and to me, that's like the most rock and roll thing. You know, your Lemmy was a roadie for Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. And I found a Lemmy roadie for the MC5. I just found that out. Yeah. Um, you know, I did not know that. Man, so, legend. but that's rock and roll. You know, you go. And then the net, when our bass player found God, he was a, he was a, 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 a he was a reformed alcoholic mm -hmm. and those guys leaned heavily on God. And then he became born again. And I remember the night he brought down his church to watch one of the Twisted Sisters show to see if, <laughs> if being a Twisted Sister and being a Christian were mutually exclusive. Right. To which, the congregation watched the show and said, yes, it is mutually exclusive. <laughs> you cannot be a Christian and be a twisted sister, which I didn't get because I was raised Christian. And I was like, I don't know. I, you know, as, as, you know, as I said in Washington, when I testified and they asked me about profanity and Christianity, I said, they have nothing to do with each other. You know, I mean, as I, you, you curse doesn't mean you're a Christian. And if you don't curse, it doesn't mean you are a Christian. Sure. So um, Mark Mendoza was the roadie, a base tech. And uh, we said, hey, man, you want to be in the band? And he was like, you serious? Was like, yeah, it's just, you know, just a couple of things. You got to shave your beard. Uh -huh. And you got to wear a face full of makeup <laughs> and you're going to have to dress glam. And uh, and because uh, all he was wearing, you know, dictators with leather jackets. And he had that, you know, he was the animal with his Fu Manchu and, you know, and uh, but he was like, I'm in, I'm in. So my wife, Suzette, who did all our hair, makeup and costumes said, he's all yours, honey. And she uh, shaved them up and made them up and dressed them up and shoved them out on the stage. And and that was well, actually, he was second to last piece. AJ Pirro was the final piece where we finally had the core unit that would go the distance. Sure. I read in your, your book that you, uh, you, met, you met Billy Joel. I mean, I'm a big Billy Joel fan, by the way. But you also said you met Richie Blackmore. What was your impression of Richie Blackmore? Wow, this was on the same night. That night changed my life forever. Mm hmm very interesting. So we were a huge, as I said, phenomenon in the tri-state area. We were, we were playing to a th thousand to four thousand people a night, unsigned band, yeah. five nights a week, people lines around the block. So we were pretty full of ourselves. We had security and bodyguards. We were like a this phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And um, and I was very caught up in being this rock star in a microcosm. You know the fact that. That you know, we had. I mean, uh, we had. You know, it was just. It was. It was like you were. You were a rock star, but you were playing. You know, in your not hometown, but home area. Mm -hmm. So it was a night before. Uh, Twisted Sister was going doing a, a free outdoor show, and this outdoor show. I'll tell you the punchline of this. It was a, a local um, fairgrounds that was doing a, a free sh concert with local bands and they were doing three to 500 people, uh, an, you know, for these free shows. So the night before that, we got invited to a party. It was a farewell party to a mutual friend uh, who was going to jail for drug dealing. And uh, turned out he was friends also with Billy Joel and with, um, and with Richie Blackmore. Okay. Um, and so they were at this party too. And the party was held at a, at a small bar and, um, you know, so Twisted was there and Richie's there and Billy's there. And I met both Richie and Billy uh, for the first time. Billy could not have been more gracious, nicer, more self-deprecating. Um, you know, he, he was just, I mean, and he, and he had uh, some big records out, uh, you yeah. know, at this point. He's a, he's a big star playing yeah. arenas. And, um, and it just, you know, just it was impressive how unaffected he was by his own success and celebrity. Mm -hmm. Then I met Richie. 
Okay. Richie, um, when he's when we're introduced, now I'm not a, I'm not a celeb. I'm I think I'm big shit. I'm yeah. on Long Island, and and they're all aware of us because we're like this local phenomenon. Uh, you know, when he when he shakes my hand, I get this fish and a turn away. So it was like, uh, you know, <laughs> so um, we're with our I'm with my wife and uh, well girlfriend then I think. And uh, he's my fiance. He's with his girlfriend, Miss All Night Long, I believe, is is a, you know, a, a wife number three or four. You know, I want to talk to you all night. No, it was her. Anyway, um, so there was a foosball table, soccer table, you know, and uh, and I said, hey, man, I want to play. So apparently he loves playing table soccer, whatever you guys call it over there. We call it we call it foosball okay. in the state. And me and my wife and him and his girlfriend, we get on the table and, you know, and, 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 and I don't play that shit. Richie is dominating and he's just, you know, just, just burying us with his expertise <laughs> on the table. And, um, and we're playing and he's really into it. And then I thought maybe, you know, like we broke the ice now we could talk and I tried to talk to him and he was so, you know, we're in a club. He's like soft talking and he won't look you in the eye and, 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 it was so weird. And I remember walking away that night and thinking about here's Billy Joel and here's Richie Blackmore. Uh -huh. um, I see myself leaning toward the Richie Blackmore attitude BS. And you can see, I said, this is where I'm headed. This sort of stupid, you know, uh, it, it just sort of you know, superiority. I don't know what he is. Anyway, and I said, you know what? I want to be more like, like Billy Joel. And from that day on, I just sort of changed my, 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 my whole foot attitude towards celebrity and stardom and what it meant to be successful mm -hmm. and and just remember how gracious billy was and and mind you that we that free concert we gave the next day had twenty three thousand people showed up wow and kiss was playing at the garden to half a house so thank god they were playing because it would have been out of control if they weren't <laughs> uh they took off some of the over spillover but yeah so we so and it was a good time because just walking out to a situation like that an unsigned band and I'd seen 23,000 people uh, just a see. It was a long time before Twisted ever played to a bigger crowd. Uh, but I already had changed my mindset, like who I was and how I was going to be regarded. Because that could have easily pushed me over into the Richie Blackmore direction. Sure, sure. Um, why did it take so long for you to finish the song, We're Not Going to Take It? And was it really inspired by the Christmas carol, Come All Ye Faithful? So... Um, I wrote the hook to We're Not Gonna Take It in 1980. Mm -hmm. It came out of me like um, words and melody, uh, just in one chunk, as they sometimes do. And then you sit there racking your brains going, is this another song? I know that, but, yeah, but I did not hear uh, another song in it. Mm -hmm. And, but I couldn't, I couldn't come up with the verse and chorus. So every time I would sit down to write songs, I'd pull out this We're Not Gonna Take It, chorus and i and i try to finish it and it wasn't until 83 that i came up with the verse and the b verse as we call it the second part the whoa whoa part um and uh finished the song and you know wound up becoming like the song mm -hmm. um it was about 15 years later late night drive with Widowmaker al petrelli's driving the van i'm sitting in the passenger side the other guys are sleeping and we're talking about songs that borrow from other songs sure. you know she's so fine uh you know george harrison she's so fine and my sweet lord mm -hmm. i mean they're famous songs famous you know famously um uh and um hey i mean you know bon jovi uh, who says you can't go home yeah. is cupid by sam by uh by sam cook cupid draw back your bow yeah. who says you can't go home you know <laughs> so but i mean it's right there and yeah. then, and then Al goes, and tw and we're not going to take it. Is uh, oh come all you faithful? <laughs> and I said what? He said, we're not going to take it. It's oh come all you faithful. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, you didn't know that. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> he goes, and then he sings, you know, we're not going to take it. Oh come all ye faithful. I mean, it's not enough to be sued over, but. Yeah. Certainly the inspiration is there and all those years of singing in the church choir, as I did, uh, paid off in the end, you know? Uh, so, yeah, so I know it wasn't, it wasn't, believe me, uh, for a metal guy to consciously 
uh, you know, borrow from a, a church hymn would not be the most metal thing to do. No. I'm metal. So, I'm metal. You know, that, yeah, though, yeah. But I, but I got that song from Oh Come All You Faithful. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure anyone owes the rights to uh, "Come All You Faithful." It's so old. No, plus it's public domain. It's 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 all those things. But there was actually a lawsuit um, in Australia where a politician took "We're Not Going to Take It" without and used it for a, a political campaign, changing the words and uh, getting a guy to record it that was trying to imitate me. And so we had to go after him. And uh, you know went to went to trial. This guy was like a, they call him the Don, it, Clive somebody Palmer in Australia. He they call him the Donald Trump billionaire. You know he's just one of those guys that you know is you know and, and he actually contacted Universal about getting the rights for his commercial campaign and then changed his mind and said I'm just going to record it without paying for it. <laughs> you know and so went to trial and that was brought up. The we're not going to take it. The old come on, he's faithful. And uh, he tried to say that it was an existing song that was, and it didn't hold up in court. The, the variations, the notes, yeah, you can see the influence of, of, the, of the chord structure, but it wasn't, uh, we won the case, he had to pay. Yay! Yeah, wonderful. Guys win. I'm interested, uh, Neil Smith auditioned for Twisted Sister. Why did you not jump at the chance to have the drummer from the Alice Cooper band in Twisted Sister? Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, so... Being in the Northeast, uh, we want, you know, and, and being in this regionally popular and famous band, um, you know, our first demo tape was done by Eddie Kramer, a mm -hmm. uh, legendary producer, engineer, you know, who got brought down by some girls. He got to see this band, Twisted Sister, and saw us, and he was like, wow, you guys are great. You know, and he did our first uh, demo at Electric Lady. It was pretty amazing. But the point being, we were sort of like, People would hear about it and, and they would come out and see it. And um, so along the way, well, the first time we met Neil, mm -hmm. um, it was a show and there was this woman in the audience, this tall blonde woman, mm -hmm. not Neil, um, and she was cursing at the band and mother up in the band, throwing stuff at the band. I mean, she looked like a model. And I mean, at one point, I remember she like reaches under her skirt and like to, to her, you know, badge and pulls out her hand, you know, and she's like, and so it was when we came off stage, uh, JJ went out to the bar and she literally attacked him. Right. So um, the security, you know, the, the bouncers come, they pull her off and uh, the cops are called. And all of a sudden this friggin Ferrari pulls up and out comes Neil Smith. This is like 1978, sure. around that time. And he comes in, it's his wife, uh -huh. bad, bad, or whatever. So she's not with her anymore. And um, he, you know, comes over to JJ and the cops. And, and, and basically, this poor bastard is dealing with this alcoholic, druggy, fashion model wife who he's constantly bailing out of jail and, and apologizing for. So, you know, he went to JJ and, hey, man, can we just let this slide? And, you know, of course, JJ's like, holy crap, it's Neil Smith. So we became friends. Uh -huh. uh, when the time came for a drummer, I said, wow, how amazing to bring Neil Smith into the band. And uh, he came down to audition. Audition. You know, like, this is, to us, this was just, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, you Malatic. know, you got Normality. Yeah. He pulls his crew, his roadie pull up, pulls out the mirrored drum kit, the legendary, completely mirrored set that he played on those Alice Cooper tours. Oh my God. It was like just to watch those things being set up as crew guys. And we and we play, and it's not good. And it's not that he's not good, is it he came from a generation of 60s drummers, 70s drummers. This sort of looser, um, you know, uh, I can't, you know, uh, Carl Mine a piece has a bit of that going on. I mean, they're great drummers, but it does this. Now we were coming into the into the late seventies, early eighties, and the drummers were more muscular, sure, and more, you know, and it was more, you know, you're just coming from this muscularity. Everything was 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 hit harder. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uh, this sort of loose kind of thing, and. One of the toughest calls I ever had to make in my life was to call Neil up and tell one of my heroes 
that it wasn't going to work out. Man, that was tough. Not bad. Awful. I mean, I we couldn't have wanted him more, but it just showed, wow, the sound of metal. You know, Alice Cooper, people like that, they were hard rock bands, you know, um, the hard rock bands, that, that early 70s glam, all those great drummers of that era were, were playing hard rock, and it was cool. But now we were Judas Priest. And, you know, in ACDC and Iron Maiden and the Scorpions, things are changing and it's much more muscular. Sure. You know, that's the best word I can use. And, and we wound up finding AJ Perro and he literally had, you know, biceps like ham hocks. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you felt sorry for the drums because it was all about how hard you could hit. Sure, sure. Um, uh, how, uh, what's the relationship between the band and Tom Worman really that toxic? And do you think Stay Hungry would have been better without him? Who? Tom Worman. I'm not familiar with the name. The producer. Oh, I see you're you're playing me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Go I'm I'm giving him. He has no spotlight, and every time I speak about him, he gets a little spotlight. I'm getting he gets. I've spoken about him at length. He's going crazy trying to call me out and get me to 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 shine a light. He's. He's insignificant. He's getting his damn royalties, that's for sure, and that's a sin. But uh, but I, I I I won't talk about him anymore. Let's move on to the next question, then, shall we? Okay. Um, how much better do you think "Come Out and Play" would have been had Bob Ezrin produced it? Dieter Dirks is a brilliant, brilliant producer. I'm still very good friends with Dieter, but he's um. Uh, He's a, a technology guy, mm -hmm. and um, and he's very into pro you know processing the sound. Now he's made some amazing records with Accept and with everybody else, but he's also embraces the newest things, the newest toys, the newest gadgets. He's very big. You know, he's a brilliant mind, and and there were some incredible tools that were as the eighties went along that were becoming available. But for Twisted Sister. Um, ultimately, you know, and by the way, I was in there with him every day going, yeah, yeah, let's try this. Let's try that. That's cool. That's cool. And, you know, but, but then, but the more you layer the sound, the more processed, the smaller everything gets instead of, uh, this is just a sound thing instead of bigger, uh, less is more when it comes to recorded sound, you go to the Zeppelin albums and ACDC albums, and it's just very stripped down. It's not a lot of layering. It's not a lot of processing. It's mm -hmm. raw as can be. So when you so again, um, when uh, now Bob Ezrin on the other hand, I never worked with Bob, mm -hmm. so I don't know. I know his work, mm -hmm. you know, and and he he does some incredible work. I mean, with Lou Reed and with Alice Cooper and you know and so many other bands, his uh, and Kiss. Yeah. Uh, he's done some incredible work, but who's to say that if Bob had gone in there in 1985, um, that he wouldn't have been enamored by the latest toys and the latest gadgets and, you know, and just trying to, you know, to take advantage of the new technology. I don't know. So it's, it's really, um, but one thing was interesting and, and you're reflecting on this, Bob Ezrin was our first choice sure. and Bob came down to my house. Um, and he listened to the new muse, new songs for Come Out and Play. And he passed on the opportunity to record Twisted. Now, A, we were friends. We'd already become friend, met and become friends. Uh, you know, B, it was a huge payday. Mm -hmm. C, we were one of the biggest bands in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm sure like me having to tell uh, Neil Smith, no, you're not in the band. Mm -hmm. uh, he had told me, he said, listen, I'm not hearing it. And I'm like, seriously, I think this is some, he goes, and he had, he was very, uh, you know, he very specific that he says, everything's in minor keys. He said, say hungry. Uh, most of the songs were in major keys. Mm -hmm. And, and, and honestly, I didn't, I'm not that much of a musician that I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, and, but so we discussed it at length and, you know, to him, it was like, I was presenting him with, the songs for the album mm -hmm. to him it was like these aren't working if we're going to work together i'm sending you back mm -hmm. to write some new new material and 
you know, I'm, I mean, as, as much as I still respect Bob and uh, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, pissed off or angry. I I mean, you rarely get that kind of honesty. <laughs> rarely, rarely, rarely. And you come in this business uh, to respect it, just for the honesty of it. Sure. Uh, with my movie Strange Land. I had uh, uh, one of my heroes, Tom Savini, uh, read it and the original script, and he said it sucks. Right. He was my friend. He was a hero, <laughs> and he was telling me to my face, my script sucks, and he said. Come visit me, and I'll explain why. And uh, I went all the way to Pittsburgh, where he lived, and we sat down. We spent many hours together, and he dissected it. And I went back, and I went back. Probably what Ezra would have liked me to do would come out and play, go back to the drawing board, start again. Came back, and I remember with Savini sending him the new script, and him going, "Creepy man, real creepy." And I was like, "Yes, Tom Savini said my script's creepy." But Bob Ezra really wanted to start over, and I was just. You know, this is 1985, and I wasn't ready to... I said, no, I think you're wrong about these songs. He goes, well, fair enough. Nobody hears it all the time. He says, but this isn't right for me. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I don't know, you know, what it would have been. But I know that... You know what I know it would have been? It would have been a different album completely because it would have been 10 new songs on there. Uh, I don't think... I think maybe he liked Be Cruel to Your School. Uh, I think he liked that one. Yeah. Uh, sticking with Bob Ezrin, do you think Kiss Destroyer is a Kiss album or is it a Bob Ezrin album? You know, I as I was a you know people often come you know uh, get upset with me the Kiss Army and Gene and Paul because I I speak out when I don't agree with things they do or say mm -hmm. and uh, being outspoken people like me occasionally going to step on a landmine. Yeah. So Gene's going to say. You know, rock and roll is dead. Don't bother to pick up a guitar. I'm going to say, dude, come on. What the, you know, get out of your mansion and go to a club. And, you know, maybe they're not getting the exposure, but the passion's there. The music's there. The talent's there. I go to shows with my kids. I go, oh, my God. I feel my heart breaks because they're not going to get the, even get the chance that I had to make it because the whole music scene's changed. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but I am a Kiss fan. Uh, I had the first Kiss album. I lived... In Nassau County, they were from Queens. Um, I was playing, you know, just starting to play, and there was this buzz about this band called Kiss mm -hmm. coming out of out of Queens that had an album coming out. So I was ready for the album. I heard about them, read a couple things in, you know, the local uh, rock scene magazine. So I, as soon as it came out, snapped that up. Sure. And I was a Kiss fan for the first, I'd say, six albums. I had, you know, I was locked uh so i'll say that when i came to destroyer it didn't strike me as not being a kiss record it struck me as being oh my god they're like next leveling it uh -huh. you know I, I felt like they were they were going to the next level and of course you know bob ezrin believe me i noticed bob ezrin's name on there and hope maybe one day i'll get to work with bob ezrin mm -hmm. well guess what i didn't <laughs> uh talking about kiss when are we going to see twisted sister avatars Oh my God. Well, <laughs> it's such a huge demand. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, then, uh, no plans. Although I, I wouldn't, you know, I've, I've seen a D Snyder action figure, D Snyder Funko Pops. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen a lot of interesting things. Um, I can't imagine that the time will ever come. And I'll be, well, I don't know. I'm sure the Kiss has already put a lot, a lot of money uh, has been put into these Kiss avatars already. Uh, didn't they show like a, a clip or something? They did, well, yeah. Their, their farewell shows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I don't think you'll see the avatars, and I don't think I'll be seeing the Kiss avatars either, me <laughs> personally. I've got uh, one last question for you, uh, and that is, um, you know, Frank Zappa said, uh, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. Uh, <laughs> with bands lip-syncing these days and playing to backing tracks and auto-tune, how healthy do you think is rock? How healthy is rock and roll? <sighs> Boy, that's a good question. You spent some time on that one, but you're probably <laughs> asking everybody that one. Um, well, this goes to the rock is dead, uh, yeah. you know, philosophy, um, and you know, and, and and because of the technology and the live bands, and you know, I talk about the young bands, you know, and um, there was this uh, uh, Ronnie Radke and Sebastian Bach had a dust up, you know, a few months ago over mm -hmm. the fact that 
uh, that falling in reverse uses uh, uses tracks. Yeah, yeah, like so many bands are using tracks now and you know when that's not rock and roll they, the old guys are screaming that's not rock and roll and ronnie radke's making fun of sebastian's age listen grandpa you know uh and um but the fact of the matter is something is lost when it isn't the guys or girls I'm totally comfortable with girls being up there on that stage making all that noise yeah you know what i mean and when it's when it's what's the what's the word I'm looking for when it's uh when it's used to I want to say subsidize that's not the right word but you know embellish. I, I, what is it to embellish to, maybe embellish thank you embellish mm -hmm. um especially with newer music you know the the stuff is so much more layered and thicker I mean we can go back to Queen you know uh, when I saw Queen and they got to the Bohemian Rhapsody, they got to the middle, just throw on the tape because there's no way we're going to do that live. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was a huge Queen fan. And, you know, so that was an embellishment. But when it's used to replace, yeah. because the person can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more of that. Singers who can't sing their own songs. Listen, you don't got to stay on the stage. Yeah. Step aside, step, walk away, make, there's, uh, there's plenty of other bands that would love to take the spot, you know? So, you know, so the embellishment thing hey, has been going on with Def Leppard. Now these bands have been doing it for years. Yeah. Um, but then there's this, you know, and, and I'm not, I don't want to point fingers at bands. I'm trying to be a, I'm trying to be a more mature uh, elder statesman of rock and not actually point fingers anymore. My wife said, you got to stop that. You got to right. stop mocking specific bands just in general we know the names we've seen the we've seen the videos on youtube we've seen the car wrecks of the band losing this losing the sync with the tape and all that and and they're not even singing anymore they're not even playing anymore it's it's just lip syncing and you know that and the the other tragedy is the essential um uh, tribute bands that are out there working the name of the actual band with one member, maybe the <laughs> drummer sometimes, which I would say, hey, yo, Ringo, you ain't the Beatles, you know, and uh, and there's bands out there using the names without even any members from the original band in the band, and yeah. people are going to the shows. So I don't, I, I, I don't get that. Yeah, I don't you know get you know, it's funny, you know, uh, people like um, Madonna and Britney Spears have said that they they have to mime to the song because they, they can't dance and sing. But then I think, well, James Brown managed it, didn't he? Oh, my God. Right. Right. There, you know, the Bruno Mars. I think he's managing it. There's some <laughs> people out there. Prince. Prince was dancing and singing. They, you know, they're doing choreographed dancing. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I ran around that stage. Like uh, I, I remember, I weighed myself before and after the show. I lost seven pounds, water weight, wow. on in, in these hot clubs. I would just water is pouring off of me, but I didn't sing really good. <laughs> in, in total fairness, I sacrificed a lot live because to me it was more the show was more important than the accuracy. If I was going to be that accurate, I'd be John Anderson, you know, from Yes, standing on a little pedestal and sing <laughs> note for note perfectly without moving a muscle, you know. But that's not rock and roll. No, absolutely. What's your favorite Billy Joel album then? Don't really have one. Um, you know, I don't have a Billy Joel album. Um, I have nothing but respect for the guy and mm -hmm. uh, and and admiration. He's from Long Island, yeah. and uh, we've been friendly over the years. Um, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't have a Twisted Sister album either. So, <laughs> uh, but he played on one. Yeah, yeah. Well, he used to be in the band. Attila, which was a really heavy band, you know. Oh, ago. that was a funny call. So, so I wanted to get, I wanted to do this song called "Be Cruel to Your School," and yeah. I wanted to get some like famous people on there, you know. And I reached out to Brian Setzer because I wanted a real rock, and we knew Brian from coming to see the band in the bars. Reached out to Clarence Clemens, um, and I reached out to Billy Joel, and I had Billy's number. We lived in the same neighborhood mm -hmm. at this point, and I called Billy, and I go, oh, "It's Billy, I know." Uh, you're, you're not into metal. But before I get to the next word, he goes, I'm not into metal. 
He goes, I was playing metal when you were in diapers. I mean, he, he got genuinely upset. I was like, well, well, he says, have you heard Attila? Have you seen the album cover with me in the meat locker with, with, a, with a suit of armor on? He says, I, I said, okay, dude, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to insult you. I was just trying to give you an out. You know, I said, I said well, will you play piano on our track? And, and he was like, yeah, sure. I mean, and that just goes back to the original Billy Control question, you know, he shows up now, it's five years later. He's even bigger star than, and he just rolls up in a taxi, walks into the recording studio, comes in by himself, no fanfare, no personal, no roadie, no nothing. And just, hey man, what's going on? Sits down, plays piano, hangs out and leaves. I mean, that, that's an, that, that, you know, people be cool. Don't be a dick. You know, that's, 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 that's Billy, Billy Joe's cool. Absolutely. Anyway, I'll just uh, reiterate what I said at the start. The graphic novel, He's Not Going to Take It, is due out on the 29th of February. There is a purchasing link just below this video. Dee, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I wish you all the best for your future endeavours and enjoy the rest of your day. It's quite I early there at the moment, it. isn't it? I, I, well, I'm, I'm having a good day, but I, I, I want to just say something about He's Not Going to Take It. And, um, and just, you know, it if, if just because you say, oh, it's it's about the Senate hearings. They wanted to do go deeper and they really spent time. It's a graphic novel, which it's which you know is aimed at adults, mm -hmm. but they wanted to just explore how did I become that person okay. at that moment, at that historic moment? How did my trajectory and the censorship, rock and roll censorship thing come together at that moment where I walked in that room and was able to speak? I think eloquently on the side of rock and roll and defend rock and roll. So they, I mean, they go as far back as I believe there's a frame of me in the crib. Actually, <laughs> they go all the way back to, uh, to figure out like what made D Snyder, D Snyder, what made D the guy to stand up when we needed someone to stand up. Yeah. So anyway, it's worth a read people who enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, have a fabulous day. Pleasure. Pleasure, man. Take care of yourself. I'm going to go back to the beach. Yeah, don't blame me. <laughs> All bye -bye. the best, mate. Bye-bye.